So if we now look at the case itself, um, the first issue is this issue of, of lack of legislation, right? Uh, there were no laws in Denmark <clears throat> dealing with general anti-abuse rules for treaties. Um, or a law implementing this text from the parent subsidiary club, as you can see, this is 1990 text I have for you here. Um, just to play along with the times that the, that the, that the case itself was playing. Uh, and, and Article 1 says the directive shall, in paragraph 2, shall not preclude the application of domestic or agreement-based provisions required for the prevention of fraud or abuse. Now, the, the, this article is pretty clear, right? It says that you can you can get an exemption from, from dividend withholding tax within Europe, um, but only if you're not abusing the directive, right? Because this directive does not in, it does not preclude the, the application of domestic or agreement-based provisions, except there were none. So how did how did the court solve this? And then the Court of Justice of the EU, in 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 these in these beneficial ownership cases, took a different approach. It it, it said. You know, by question one, this is a question from the Danish court to the EU court on how to interpret the law. The referring court asks first whether the combating of fraud or abuse as permitted by Article 1, Paragraph 2 of Directive 9043.5 requires there to be a domestic or agreement-based anti-abuse provision as referred to in that article. And the court takes an interesting approach. The court says... It is settled case law that there is in EU law a general legal principle that the EU that EU law cannot be relied on for abusive or fraudulent ends. And then the court quotes a whole long list of cases. It talked about the Centros case from 97. It also talks about Halifax, which is a pretty famous uh, anti-abuse case in, 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 in EU law. Um, and what the court basically says, you know, the, 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 there is a general principle made by the court on 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 how to um, uh, that that you cannot abuse EU law and <coughs> what the court basically says is this is primary law the directive is secondary law and the directive cannot push the primary law aside so the court then goes on to say whilst article 1 2 of directive 9435 provides that the directive is not to preclude application of domestic or agreement based provisions required for the prevention of fraud or abuse that provision cannot be interpreted as excluding the application of the general principle of eu law noted in paragraph 70 and 72 above that abusive practices are prohibited so the court is, uh, helps the Danish government and says, you know what, you don't need a law because this is general EU practice. So that makes sure that Denmark does not have to apply the parent subsidiary directive between for dividend payments made from Denmark to Cyprus, um, even though both uh, countries are within the EU and even though the um, parent subsidiary directive would otherwise apply. It does not deal <coughs> with the Cyprus and the... Um, the, the Cyprus Danish tax treaty. So let's have a look at that next. If you look at the, the beginning of the of the treaty, just to remind you, Article 10, Paragraph 1 says that it is the resident state that can tax, right? The, uh, but, but but it also says the source state can tax, but it must limit its uh, source tax if the recipient is the beneficial owner of the dividends. And that's what the Danish uh, Cyprus treaty said as well so there is this requirement of beneficial ownership and the court then rightly goes to article 3 2 and it says as regards the application of the convention by a contracting state so the, in this case denmark any term not defined therein shall unless the context otherwise requires have the meaning which it has under the law of that state concerning the taxes to which the convention applies now one way of dealing with this would say you know what there are no laws which define beneficial ownership and therefore uh, we, 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 we cannot look at national law but the Danish court makes an Supreme Court makes an interesting turn it says the term beneficial ownership is not defined in the collective agreements since the term delimits the contracting state's mutual taxation competence which I think is a Google translation for for the balance allocation of taxing powers uh, the Supreme Court finds 
that it follows from the context that the meaning cannot depend on the contracting state's respective legislation. Now, now this is, I find it a very strange detour from the Supreme Court because if you're not going to look at national law, why even bother to quote Article 3.2? I mean, then you can just start by quoting the commentary saying that the commentaries should be used for interpreting the treaty. But the court does not directly do that, but it does refer to the commentaries. So the court does not say that the commentaries say that you can look at the commentaries when interpreting the treaty. Because remember, we're now in the realm of interpretation of treaties, which is ruled by the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. And the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties does not say anything about the OECD Model Convention commentaries, simply because the OECD Model Convention commentaries are pretty unique. right? The Danish Supreme Court goes and, 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 and says, well, this is an old treaty, so uh, this is many, many years ago, because they, they, the dividends were paid in 2005 and 2006. So um, <clears throat> it, it first looks to, it first refers to the 97 Moral Convention. I don't have the text of the commentaries of that anymore, but if you look at the 1992 commentary, it says under paragraph 12 on the commentary of Article 10, it says under paragraph 2, which we just looked at, of the treaty, the limitation of tax in the state of source is not available when an intermediary, such as an agent or nominee, is interposed between the beneficiary and the payer, unless the beneficial owner is a resident of the other contracting state. States which, which wish to make this more explicit are free to do so in their bilateral treaties. Now, one could say Cyprus and Denmark did not do that in their bilateral treaties, so one wonders whether this applies, right? Um, the Danish Supreme Court then also refers to 2003 commentaries, which, which expanded on, on paragraph 12 that we looked up here. And then not only did it, did it put more text to a paragraph 12 itself, that you can see for yourself on the screen here, where it talks about beneficial ownership, uh, um, meaning uh, clarifying the meaning of the words paid to a resident, um, and it, it makes sure that, it, the, that the source state is not obliged to, to reduce the tax if, 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 the, if the payment is not to a beneficial owner, right? And it says the benefit of owner is not used in a narrow technical sense. Rather, it should be understood in its context and in the light of the object and purpose of the convention, uh, including avoiding double tax and prevention of fiscal evasion and avoidance. So, uh, very modern language, almost post peps And then the Supreme Court refers to paragraph 12.1, which builds further on this and says, it would be equally inconsistent with the object and purpose of the convention for the state of source to grant relief or exemption where a resident of a contracting state, otherwise than through an agency or nominee relationship, simply acts as a conduit for another person who in fact receives the benefit of the, of, of the, of the income, right? So, so if you were just a conduit, and, 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 and the Danish tax authorities claim that Cyprus was just a conduit, then you're not entitled or you cannot be the beneficial owner either. And, and on these grounds, the Danish Supreme Court basically decides, okay, you know, you're not a beneficial owner, so you're not entitled to the benefits. But now we do need to look further at, um, at, at, at where the dividends go. <clears throat> you know, maybe if they went straight to the U.S. and the U.S. is the beneficial owner and therefore the U.S. Danish treaty could apply, then still there would be no dividend withholding tax due. And then the strange thing here is there were two dividends paid and, and almost counterintuitively, the second one qualified for the exemption, but the first one did not. So, so let's have a look at this. The first, the first dividend was paid 28 September or, or, or declared 28 September 2005. And remember this meant it went from, from, from Denmark to Cyprus, from Cyprus to Bermuda, right? It was for Danish 566 million kroners, which came to about 92 million US dollars, and it was received by NetApp Bermuda in October 2005 and paid to NetApp US April 2006. And, 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 and the payment had to be made before the 30th of, of, of uh, April 2006 because the law that reduced <coughs> the, 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 the uh, the U.S. income tax on 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 on, on dividends received abroad. There were there, there, there was a temporary um, 
tax haven uh, ge generated for dividends paid from from all these tax haven countries to the US instead of paying 30% 37% tax um, net Apamura said it would pay if it paid the dividends before um, this law came into, pl uh, into place it was called the US Job Creation Act um, it now only paid five to six percent but that six five uh, but that dividend had to be paid before the 30th of April 2006 for net app Bermuda because that's when his financial year in 2006 ended so the dividend was received by Bermuda in 2005 October and was paid to the US April 2006 um, within the, the the deadline for the U, for the US job creation act five to six percent tax on these dividends um, but the court says you know according to the Danish Supreme Court I mean Neta Bermuda invested the dividends in bonds between 2005 and 6 so it had the money for five months it invested it in bonds because obviously it was a lot of money and you wanted it to work um, and, and the court then says that NetApp US was not the beneficial owner of the dividend uh, because NetApp Bermuda among others invested the money in bonds before it paid it on to NetApp US five months later so 28 percent dividend with the uh, Danish dividend withholding tax was due and the Supreme Court found that there was no detailed information about the background to the fact that in 2005 it was decided to establish a company structure according to which NetApp Citrus was to be established as a new parent company for NetApp Denmark and then to be included in a combined dividend transaction from NetApp Denmark to NetApp Bermuda to NetApp US instead of just making the payment to NetApp US uh, directly from Denmark right so 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 the court uh, the, the court's decision looks strange but it is not right in the sense that NetApp has explained to the court how it worked with the US CFC rules and with and, and, and with the check the box rules and that there was this break period in which they could pay the the, the, the dividends early to um, or, or cheaper to the US um, they did explain all of this but but if you think it through well I mean if you were going to pay the dividends from Denmark ultimately to the US then apparently the 37 percent tax didn't matter anymore because you were not going to pay that you were going to pay six percent and if you were going to pay to the US to make use of the six percent in any case why do you need why do you need Bermuda you could just say Denmark pays to the US and under the Danish US treaty there would be no dividend withholding tax due right um, so the court does have a point when they say you know you you could have done this for zero percent you were going to pay tax on this in the, in the US in any case so why did you need Cyprus and Bermuda the second but the first decision makes the second decision even stranger right because there was also a dividend paid out for 92 million Danish kroners and this was declared October 13 2006 and it was only paid in 2010 because only then did Denmark have the cash to pay it right um, so there was a loan and interest and, and things like that in in in, in the meantime um, but but in view of the court's decision that you know that the first dividend uh, of 566 million kroners which was declared in uh, September 2005 and was paid in April 2006 five months later the US got the money that that was not uh, pointing to you as being the beneficial owner but this one which was declared after the job creations act deadline right but still apparently the dividend was included in the in, in the in the calculations that were made for the dividends paid from Bermuda to the US before the the 30 April deadline and only paid in 2010 when uh, NetApp Denmark finally got the cash this dividend was okay there was no dividend withholding tax due on it right so so the court says on March 20, 22, 2006, the board of directors of NetApp US decided to distribute a dividend of 550 million US dollars from NetApp Bermuda to NetApp US, including by NetApp Bermuda taking out a loan of 300 million US dollars so, so that you could be, actually make the payment. 
According to what was stated, the reason was that the American Jobs Creation Act 2004 gave American companies the opportunity to repatriate dividends from their foreign subsidiaries for particularly Lelian taxation in return for committing to using the dividends for special purposes in the U.S. So you had to bring the money back and you had to use the money, uh, the money in the U.S. And the idea was that you would probably use it to expand your U.S. activities, thereby you would create jobs in the U.S., right? The dividend was to be repatriated no later than the end of the 2006 financial year, which for NetApp US was 30 April 2006. The dividend was distributed on 3 April 2006 and taxed in the US. So, so um, it was it was it was uh, declared 22 March. It was distributed on 3 April 2006, and the accounts for Netta Bermuda in 2005 so 2006 showed that a dividend of 550 million US dollars was declared. That still does not explain how the dividend from Denmark, which was only declared 13 October 2006 and only paid in 2010, could be included in this amount. But but the Supreme Court decides that it is included, and, it's, and it finishes with the word saying on the stated background, the Supreme Court, because it showed in the books that the, the dividends were paid, were, were, were trans, no, not paid, but declared and due, and therefore there was interest accruing in the books of the payors, right, of the pay, of the, of the, of the, of the dividend paying companies, right? So the Supreme Court say on the stated background, what I just referred to, the Supreme Court find it proven that the dividend of approximately 92 million DKK from NetApp Denmark was included in the dividend of DKK 550 million US dollars, which NetApp Bermuda transferred to NetApp US on April 3, 2006, with the result that no Danish dividend withholding tax was due on the 92 million um, kroner distribution. I, I hope you followed the details. I found the details a little confusing, especially here towards the end with, with the dates and the numbers and, 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 and the seemingly conflicting arguments or underlying logic. Uh, but this is what the Danish Supreme Court has decided and um, this is where we leave it. I look forward to discussing another case with you another time. Bye for now.